All right, so we've been in a series, as I've been teaching it anyway, on the doctrines of grace or, uh, or how God works in salvation. Uh, and this today is the third part of the sovereignty of God in salvation. Does anybody know the five points of the doctrines of grace or otherwise known as Calvinism under the acoustic of tulip? Would anybody know those five? Grace, yeah. boom. And perseverance. Perseverance of the saints. All right, very good. All right, so, so our first time out, we looked at everything we said hangs on and anchors on a um, uh, uh, man's condition, right, which is total depravity. And we said that if man is totally depraved, that means there's no way he can or will or want to come to God on God's terms. His, his, his nature must be changed. He, he has a free will, but his free will, his will is governed by his nature, and he will always act according to his nature. So he'll never come to God on God's terms. He can never love God or follow God unless God changes the inside first, or the nature. Uh, and so therefore, if that's the case, and it is the case, and we looked at a ton of verses on that, where the scriptures you know, say that man can't do anything in and of himself, then election can't be on conditions. Election must be on no conditions or unconditional. Right? We said that you can't, you can't say election doesn't exist, and some people say that, but that's ridiculous because the Bible says a ton about election, and everybody's got to agree that whatever it means, God is doing it because it says God does it. All right? And so we said that, uh, that, that the idea of conditional election means that God elects on conditions, like he sees down the tunnel of time, and he sees Rebecca Juarez, and he sees that in the year 2000 and whatever it is, she's going to believe, and therefore God elects her because he sees she's going to do it. So that's foreknowledge, as they would say. He foreknows what she's going to do. And so it's a condition. She will do something, therefore God will elect her when she does it. Well, he knows she's going to do it, so he's going to elect her because she's going to do it. Uh, so that's conditions. Uh, we talked a lot about that. We talked a lot about foreknow. Um, and when the Bible uses the word for no, when, when Peter uses it, when Paul uses it, it doesn't just mean to like, I know something beforehand. That's very obvious. God knows everything beforehand, right? He knows we're told the end from the beginning. But it means to know relationally, to have an intimate relationship with. We said, for example, in Amos 3, 2, where he says to Israel, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Now we said, does that mean that he didn't know the Philistines, that he didn't know the Syrians, that he didn't know, you know, the Babylonians, of course he knew them. He knew everything about them. But he's saying, you, Israel, the only ones that I know, meaning I have a relationship with. You know, the same word is used when Adam knew his wife. The same word is used for know there. Adam knew his wife, and there's an intimacy there. Jesus said uh, uh, in, in Matthew 20 and 7, 22, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we done these things in your name? And he'll answer them, uh, depart from me, you who do work in equity. I never knew you. It's not that he didn't know who they were. He knows, again, everything about all of us. In fact, Psalm 139 says he knows our thoughts before we think them. So it's not that he doesn't know, but I never knew you, meaning you were never mine. You were never mine. In John uh, 17, 3, he said, this is eternal life that they may know you, right? The only true God. So eternal life is we know God because he knows us. There's this relationship. Um, we said... In John 10, 14, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and am known by them. Right? So he knows the sheep. Uh, meaning meaning that, that, that he doesn't know intimately the goats. He knows who they are. He knows who all men are. He created them. Right? But he doesn't know them in a relational way. So, so the idea of, of foreknowledge or, or being a condition that you can be elected on uh, doesn't wash. It doesn't wash. Uh, again, there's a ton of verses that say you know, the man can't do it, right? There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who understand. There's none who does good. And the, the list is long. All right, so election must be, therefore, unconditional. God elects because he chooses to elect. And we talked much about that. I gave you a ton of verses, right? I gave you a ton of verses to show you that. Uh, basically, 
showing that not only does God elect, but God elects even before the foundation of the world. So, so before, before anything was ever created, he, not only did, has he always known you, but God doesn't have a thought like in time, because remember, before he creates, there is no time, because he creates time, right? There's no time before he creates. Uh, so he's always known you, he has always loved you, uh, and, and you have always been his people. And it would be acted out in time where, 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 where Jesus would come to die for you, the Spirit would come to awaken you, make you, bring you to life, and bring you home one day to him in glory. All right, so now, so if, if, if man uh, is totally depraved and election is not on conditions, right, now we come to the next point, and it's a logical point, and by the way, you know, everything stands or falls on, on the first point, right? So if, if, if man is not totally depraved, if there's some good in him, well, then clearly that there's some good in him, then, then election could be conditional because he could do some good. And then clearly the atonement would not be limited to a select group of people, but would be for all people because all people have some good in them. Uh, and then you could resist his grace if you want, and then, and then you could lose what you gain, so you won't persevere. All right, so, so if man you know, has some good in him, then, then election cannot be un, unconditional because man, man can do something. But if man can't do anything, if he's totally depraved, if every aspect of his being is tainted by sin, his will, his intellect, his conscience, his desire, all of that stuff is, is, is tainted by sin. And we said when we talked about, we talked about the depravity of man, we're not as bad as we can be, right? We're not all Hitlers, but, but we're, every area of our lives is, is, is soiled by sin, which keeps us from, from, from knowing God and separates us from him. All right, so now, if man is totally depraved, and he is, and, and, and the, an election by God is unconditional, and it is, well, now, what do we do with the atonement? All right, what do we do with the atonement? Um, and that's the third point today. And it's probably the most controversial point uh, when we come, to, we come to the atonement. Now, what is the atonement? When we talk about the atonement, what are we talking about? Sacrifice that Jesus did? Yes. Someone want to fill a little more in there? Want to add a little something to that? And substitution of punishment? Yeah. All right. It's sacrifice that Jesus played, the punishment, taking our sins. Yes, he is paying for our sins. Right? He's, he is suffering the, the, the payment that we owe, taking away God's, God's just punishment and wrath for what we deserve. He's atoning for us. All right? Uh, and so the question is, you know, what is the atonement? And you just said it right. And then the next question about the atonement is this. Did Jesus pay for the sins of all the world, everybody all-inclusive, uh, or only the elect? So did he pay for everybody, the whole world, everybody's sins, every single person who's ever lived, and 95% of churches are going to teach that, or did he just pay for the sins of the elect? So did he pay for the elect and the non-elect, if we will? And did he pay for everybody? Did he pay for the sins of everybody? Did he die for everybody all-inclusive or just for those the Father gave to him? Right? Who did he die for? Everybody or who the Father gave for him, to him? And I would add uh, that if we want to rightly understand the heart of the gospel and to, and to preach the heart of the gospel, then we really need to understand the atonement and what happened. This is like the, the bullseye of the gospel is the atonement. Right? What actually happened? Is Jesus paying for the sins of every person, or is he paying for the sins of the elect? It's going to differ greatly how you preach. It's going to differ greatly how you teach, you know, how, how you understand it. All right? Well, what I'd like to do is to ask two questions, and we'll look at those two questions. And the first question is, who did Jesus die for? The second question is, what did his death actually accomplish? Who did he die for? What did his death actually accomplish? And then what I'd like to do is look at the meaning of a couple of words that are pretty important because they really... They really um, are, 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 are what are used uh, for those who believe in a universal atonement, and that is words like all and words like world. Like, what do words like all and world mean? Right? Because I'm, I'm going to tell you when we get there, we may not get there today on that part, I'm going to tell you they don't always mean what we think they mean. All right? They don't always mean what we think they mean, and we're going to look at that, and we're going to see what they mean. All right. So first, who did he actually die for? 
Uh, now, in, 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 in religious circles, really, this is like the $6 billion question. And there were really maybe only three views you could have here. One is that he literally died for every single person and will save every single person who has ever lived. And you know what that's called? Universalism. That's universalism. It doesn't make a difference who you are. He's died for everybody, and everybody's going to heaven. I don't like how rotten you are in this world. That's it. Universalism. The second option is that Christ literally died for all men, but only those who believe will be saved. So he literally died for everybody, but only those who believe out of that everybody will be saved. And you know what that's called? Arminianism. That's called Arminianism, and that's what most churches are. He died for everybody, right? Every single person he died for, but only those who believe out of everybody will actually be saved. And we're going to look at that a lot and, and try to like, like, like see scripturally if that washes or not. The third option is that Christ only died for God's elect, and every one of them will be saved. Right? Christ only died for God's elect and every single one of the elect will be saved. You know what that's called? Calvinism. All right? So we have universalism, Arminianism, and Calvinism. Those are your three options concerning the atonement. Well, I think we can immediately eliminate universalism. Ray, why can we eliminate un universalism? That everybody's going to go to heaven. Well, if that was the case, then why did he die? There was no need because... You know, people are still going to sin, and God can't tolerate sin in any way, shape, or form. So, you know, if everybody's going to heaven, then uh, God is not a God is not a God of His word. Okay. And he, 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 then He's calling Himself a liar. All right. All right. Did you want to add something, Claude? There being no need for hell. What'd you say? No hell. No. Yeah. Well, I mean, why even create hell? Well, I guess for the devil and his angels, but. But really, so nobody would go to hell, all right? Uh, but, but we know, we know from the scriptures, clearly, uh, and I think just in humanity, like, like, like experiencing living in this world, uh, sadly, the large majority of humanity is going to end up in hell. They do not believe, all right? Now, Arminian says he died for all men, but only those who believe will be saved. So that means he died for Judas Iscariot, he died for Adolf Hitler, he died for every person who's in hell right now, uh, and all those who will end up there. That means that he, di he died for those uh, that he will pour out wrath and judgment on. So God will pour out wrath and judgment on people Jesus died for who are in hell. Yes, Raymond. Also, but also when, when people say that they made a decision for Christ, what they're saying is that God is not sovereign, that God has to stand back and sit on his hands and wait, wait for you to make a decision well, you know, that was last week, or last time. That was un unconditional election. Yes. Okay, yeah. Yes. But you're right. But it ties into what you're yes. talking about now. Yes, you're right. You're right. All right, so so that means that he died for those who are going to suffer the judgment of God in hell. He literally paid for their sins, even though they're going to pay for murder anyway. That means that he died for those who curse him and, and have cursed him out and have rejected him to their deaths. And we have all known people like that, that have wanted nothing to do with him up to death. Uh, that means that he died for every atheist and devil worshiper who has ever lived. Hmm. He's died for them. And, and there are a problem, brother, because if God died for everybody, <coughs> can be any more judgment day because he's already paid. Well, the Arminian says, not so. There is a judgment day because you need to still believe. You need to, and then we're going to get to that, but yeah. The universalism, they, they said that way too, that because God paid for all men. Right. So. But, but, but we're going to see the, ration, the rationale is not going to work there. Right. All right? Calvinism says he died for a specific group of people called the elect. It says the atonement is limited to the elect, whoever the elect are. Uh, now, it's hard to read the scriptures and not conclude that Christ came for a very specific group of people. Right? Think about it. He came for a very specific group of people. All right? I'll give you some verses there. Matthew 121. You shall call him... His people. He will save his people. That means that means there are his people and there are those who are not his people. All right, but there's more. John 10, 14. We looked at it a second ago. Somebody read that. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep and and am known by my own. Alright, so I know my sheep. I know my sheep, and, and I am known by them. Matthew 25, 
Jesus tells us on the last day, on the day of judgment, he's going to put the, the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left hand, right? Uh, and he's going to judge. Again, he is putting people into categories, two groups. There's the sheep, there's the goats, right? There's my people and there's not my people. In Ephesians 5.32, this group is called the church. There we read, this is a great mystery, Paul says, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. All right, so the church is, is a specific group of people. Specific group of people. Uh, in Revelation 21.9, this group is called the bride. This group is also called the lamb's wife. The bride and the lamb's wife. Now, not everybody's the bride, and not everybody's the lamb's wife. 1 Peter 2, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, right? What are these people called? A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and his own special people. Those are all describing a group of people. In Acts 20, 28, again, they are called the church of God. Uh, in Romans 8, 33, they are called the elect. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Right? In 2.15, in Philippians 2.15, what are they called? Did I give it to you? No. The children of God. They're called the children of God. Now, of course, there's the, there's the sons of God, there's the sons of Satan, as we read. All right? Also, we're told in Matthew 13, what two groups of categories do we have in the church? In one of the parables? The what? The wheat and the we have wheat and tare. Mm. All right? There's two categories of people. Who are the wheat? Those are the believers. Those are the elect. That's the church. Those are the sons of God. All right? Who are the tares? They're the unbelievers. They're the goats. All right? So, so again, you see he's categorizing people. Um, in Galatians 3.23, 3.26, right? These people are called the sons of God. Right? Before we were saved, what are we called? In Ephesians 2, we're called sons of disobedience. But now we're sons of God. We've gone from this category to this category. All right, so, so you'll see that he's, he, all throughout the New Testament, there, there are two groups of people. And i.e., they're believers and unbelievers. They're the, the elect and the non-elect. Uh, and, and, and on and on. Uh, now, as we look at the epistles, right? Epistles are letters that are written to the churches and to believers. Take notice of how the pronouns are used and remember, again, this is written to churches and believers. Paul's not writing to the world. When he, writes, when he writes his epistles, he's writing to groups of believers, to churches. So, uh, somebody read what he says in uh, Romans 4.25, that Christ was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. All right. Who was he delivered up for? Uh, our offenses, right? To the Roman believers he's talking to. And he was raised up for our justification. Not everybody's justification, right? And he said in Galatians 1, 1, 4 that Jesus, somebody read that one. He himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from his present evil age. He's talking to the Galatians, the, the church, church of Galatia with, with the saints there. He gave himself for our sins. He gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us. Again, the pronouns are important. He's not talking about you know, all humanity. He's talking about us. Uh, in Galatians 3.13, he said to the saints in Galatia that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. All right? Somebody read Romans 8.31 and 3 to 33. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. You see, the us are the, are the saints in, in Rome, and he calls them God's elect. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? We could say, who shall bring a charge against us? Because he said, us, 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 us. You know, if God is for us, who can be against us? Right? Uh, he delivered him up for us all. All of us. Right? And he's freely given us all things. So I see from these verses that that it was God's elect that Jesus was delivered up for. Right, Peter also tells us that the atonement was restricted to a specific group in 1 Peter 2, verse 24. Somebody read that. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, 
having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. So he's talking to these suffering saints that, that are dispersed, right? We know that from 1 Peter 1. Mm -hmm. so, so he's talking about us. He bore our sins. He's talking to the, to the Christians who are, who, are, who are struggling in their, in, in, with persecution. Why? That we, having died to sins, live for righteousness. By whose stripes you have been healed. All right? In Mark 10, 45, it tells us that Jesus' death wasn't for all men inclusive, but he came to give his life a ransom for many. 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 Right? In Hebrews 9, 28, it's going to say the same thing. He was offered up once to bear the sins of many. Many. Isaiah 53, 11 tells us that Jesus shall justify many, right? For he shall bear their iniquities. All right, now what does many mean? Does many mean all inclusive? No. Many means many. You know I mean? It just a means lot, but not everybody. It's not everybody. It's a group. It's many. Right? The group, many means the elect. Uh, many, many means, many means the church. Many means the sheep. All right. Like for example, if you you say many people came, it doesn't mean it was standing room only, but there was many. There was right. There was a a, a a certain amount. I can't believe he's in the building. I can't believe it. <laughs> this is my my good friend George. Hello, George. Sorry, I'm late. George, oh, George, George, we're on, we're on limited atonement. Buckle up. <laughs> All right, so, 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 so many means, you know, it's it's many means a group, the group of many. All right. Uh, now let's also consider uh, that these particular people uh, are Jesus's friends, uh, and those who he died for were his friends. All right. Let's let's think about it. So this group, this group of the many, or the sheep, or the elect. They're, they're his friends, right? Because John 15, 13 says, somebody read that. Greater love is no one than this, that men to lay down one's life for his friends. He laid down his life for his friends. All right? So, so we see that Jesus laid his life down for his friends only. Did he lay his life down for his enemies? Did he lay his life down for, for, for those who wanted nothing to do with him? Right? For his friends. Uh, and then verse 16 tells us that Jesus cho chooses us or chooses who his friends are. They don't choose him. Somebody read uh, verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and, and bear fruit. All right. So he chooses who his friends will be. You know, those who he will give his life for. Of course, those are the, everyone that the Father has given him. We read that in John 6. All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me no means cast out. All right? And so, so he chooses who his friends are, and he lays his life down for his friends. You didn't choose me. I chose you. All right? So let's ask ourselves this question. Are all friends of Christ? Is everybody we know a friend of Christ? No. no. And of course, the answer is no. Are the Muslims friends of Christ? Are the Hindus, the Buddhists, the atheists, the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, are they friends of Christ? Are most of the people you know, except for the church, of course, are they friends of Christ? No. We pray they would be one day, and while there's life in them, there's hope. Yes, amen. But, but, but they're not friends at this point, and people live and die never being friends of Jesus. They just live and die never being. All right. Well, and how do we know that? How do we know they're not friends? Because friendship with Christ is evidenced by obedience to him. Friendship with Christ is evidenced by obedience to him. And that's exactly what he said in John 15, 14. Somebody read John 15, 14. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. All right. So now we know his friends are those who follow him and who seek to obey him. Those are the people he died for. Those who do not follow him and who do not seek to obey him and live and die that way, he did not die for he didn't pay for their sins. He paid for the sins of his friends. All right? So then how could Jesus die for those who were never his friend? How could he die for those who were... How could he pay for the sins of people who were never his friends? Well, I hope from the text we looked at so far, you see that humanity is divided up between believer and unbeliever. There's groups of people in the Bible. Right? There's different groups of people, believers, unbelievers, sheep, goat, 
church world, wheat, tear, sons of God, sons of the devil, the sons of wicked one, and on and on and on. You have these two categories of people. And understand uh, that our Arminian brothers and sisters say that Jesus literally died for and paid for the sins of every single human being, friend and foe of Jesus, that has ever lived. So that's what every single pastor who, who believes in a universal atonement will, will teach, that he died for everybody. All right, that's what they're teaching. Uh, and we're going to see more and more how this really doesn't make sense. Uh, and, and it doesn't wash scripturally. Um, um, and that, that means that, 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 that means he, he paid for the sins of the goats. He paid for the sins of the tear. He paid for the sins of the world. He paid for the sins of the sons of the devil. And he paid for the sins of everyone who hates him and lives and dies hating him and his gospel. That's what that's saying. But they will say that only those who believe in him will enjoy the blessing uh, of his salvation. So, in other words, he's already paid for them, but now they, they have to, if they believe, then, that, then that, that, that gets applied to them. All right? And we'll look at that in a bit too, more, too. Uh, and that Jesus didn't actually secure salvation. So here's what it's saying. Jesus didn't actually secure salvation for anyone on the cross. It wasn't secured for anybody on the cross, but his death made it possible for all men. So, so the Arminian point of view is that Jesus' death made it possible for everybody to be saved, but only those who will believe in him will actually be saved. So nobody is actually saved from the cross, but it's possible. It's out there for everybody. It's possible. Therefore, he died for everybody, but unless they accept it by faith, then it doesn't apply to them. Let me give you an illustration of this. It would be like me buying every person I know a brand new car. I hit the lotto. All right, I'm buying everybody a brand new car. Uh, and it, it would be their car with their name on it, uh, with the keys in it, sitting in the parking lot waiting for them to come and drive it away. But here's the thing. They have to come. They got to open the door. They got to turn on the key. And they got to drive it away. It's sitting there. Michelle, it's there. Right? You, you got you to gotta go downstairs. You got to open that door, turn that key, and you got to do it. Uh, you got to do it. Uh, it's yours to have. So it's yours, but you have to activate it, so to speak. You have to activate it. I heard a guy once share the gospel with somebody, and I was with him, and I didn't say anything because I was trying to share it with this guy as well, and I didn't want to get into like a, like a scuffle over it. But, but I'm talking to this unsaved guy, and his friend comes along for, I was on a job in Georgia at the time, and his friend comes along who, 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 is, who is Arminian. And so he's, he's sharing with his friend, and he says, you know, he goes, salvation is like this. God gives you a gift, and he puts it outside your door. And it's right there. Salvation is there. All you got to do is open the door and take it. I mean, he's dropped it off for you. And if you don't open the door and take it, you don't have it. But it's there. It's ready for you. But now you got to do it. All right? So that's what it is. It's really, you have to pull the trigger. It's already supplied for you. And that's, that's the Arminian view of salvation. Jesus died for you. He's already paid for your sins. But now you have to activate it by believing. You got to like press the activation button. So you gotta you gotta do this work, and right. But we know that. But, but what do we know from Ephesians two eight and nine? Anybody? For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works. Not of works. Less and and pushing the activation button is works. That's a work. All right. You having to believe is a work. All right. You're contributing to your salvation. Right. It's in a very small way, but you're contributing. Well, let's put it this way. God can't save you unless you do it. Right. So you can you can thwart and frustrate God's plan to save you by not by not taking it. All right? So now God is really waiting for you to do your part so that he can fulfill his part. And that's what it's saying. All right. Well, there are quite a few biblical problems with this position. Uh, for one, it assumes that man is willing and able to believe in the gospel apart from the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. It assumes that man can do it, right? It assumes man is not totally depraved. It assumes that man has the wherewithal to actually believe, even though Ephesians 2, chapter verse, verse 1 says he is dead in trespasses and sins. So now a spiritually dead person is somehow going to muster it up and believe, all right? Or we can go through the, the litany of, of, of Romans chapter 3 of all the uh, non-righteous, none, none good, none seeks after God, and the whole thing. We can go through all the nuns there, and it somehow says that you can somehow, you know, you can somehow do what no one else can do. All right? 
And so it assumes that man is willing and able to believe in the gospel. It assumes that, apart from the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. Apart from that. Secondly, the scriptures teach that God elects unconditionally and that it's not based on what men will do. Because man can't do anything in and of himself. Nothing good. Now the Arminians have a real dilemma because there are only really three options regarding uh, Christ's death which will prove uh, that, that the Arminian point of view is irrational. So here it is. Right? It's Jesus Christ paid the price and endured God's wrath against sin for either one, all the sins of all men, two, all the sins of some men, or three, some of the sins of all men. John Owen said this. All right, so, so, so here's the dilemma. You have three options on, on what his, 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 his atonement did. Either, either he paid for, the, for God's wrath against the sin of, of all the sins of all men. So everybody sins for everybody. Or all the sins of some men. Or some of the sins of all men. Does that make sense so far? You see the three categories? All right. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's number three, which is some of the sins of all men, then, then all men still have some guilt because of their sins to answer for, and that would mean all men would go to hell. So in other words, if he's paid for some of the sins of all men, that means he didn't pay for all the sins of all men, and that means you still have sin, and that means you're still damned for your sin. So that is an absolute wash. That, that, mean, that can't make sense at all. So number three is no good. Uh, number one, if number one is true, that he paid for all the sins of all men, then logically, if he paid for all the sins of all men, then what would, what would logically that, that, that have to be? What would he have to logically say if that were the case? If he paid for all the sins of all men, logically? That everybody would come to Christ. All men would be saved. Yeah. I mean, if he paid for all the sins of all men, it's only logical to think that all men would be saved. And then that means all these, they don't have to come to Christ because he's going to save all men, which it shows well, how false it is. Right, right. So how could Jesus pay for a person's sins when they have to pay for them in hell themselves. So think about it. Everybody who's in hell under the Arminian position, they're paying for their sins forever, but Jesus paid for them too. Right? Jesus paid for them too. And by the way, in, in, in legal terms, what is that called? Double, Double jeopardy. Double jeopardy. <laughs> All right? Jesus paid for them, now you're gonna pay for them. Yeah. All right, so, so which all obviously says that Jesus wasn't able to seal the deal. His, his, his atonement wasn't good enough because they have somehow, somehow lost it anyway, right? Uh, so it would make sense that if, if he paid for all the sins of all men, that the all men would go to, go to heaven, right? But that means that he died for people who ended up in hell and were paying for their sins there. That would mean that Jesus suffered God's wrath for their sins, and then they have to suffer their, God's wrath for it as well. So it's double wrath. Jesus suffered wrath, now they're suffering wrath. That would mean that Jesus died for their sins and then he was unsuccessful to save them. Think about it. He died for somebody's sins and then couldn't get him into heaven. Mm -hmm. He was unsuccessful in saving them. That's the Arminian position. That would mean that God's plan of redemption is really a colossal failure. God simply could not get the job done. He was not able to save everyone that Jesus died for. Right? If Jesus actually died for the whole world, then the whole world should be saved. Because he's God. How could God not save who he comes to save? Yes, Raymond. I forget exactly what a scripture verse is, but when it says that uh, God's word will not return void, if it was the Arminian view, his word would return void constantly. Yes. Where in this way, under election, None will, will return void because all will come. Right. Right. I think it's Isaiah 64. Yeah. Um, all right, so a man, uh, I, I gave you a quote by a guy named Botner. Yes. Somebody read that? Good. If the suffering death of Christ was a ransom for all men rather than for the elect only, then the merits of his work must be communication, communicated to all alike. And the penalty of eternal punishment cannot be justly afflicted on any. God would be unjust if he demanded this extreme penalty twice over, first from the substitute and then from the persons themselves. Again, like in the law of our land, I mean, if you get tried for a crime and you either go away for it or are, 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 are called guilty, they can't try for it again. 
You can't be tried for the same. You, there's no, you, you, there's no double jeopardy. George, you work for the, the legal system. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. I do. All right. Now, if number two is true, that Christ died for all the sins of some men, if he died for all the sins of some men, uh, then, then, then one believes that 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 only some men, i.e., God's elect, will be saved and go to heaven. So he died for all the sins of one category of people, the elect. He died for all the sins of his sheep. He died for all the sins of everyone who is the church. All right? He didn't die for all the sins of all men, because then, then the vast majority of men, he was unsuccessful in saving. And they're going to pay for the sins that he supposedly paid for as well. All right? But he died for all the sins of every single believer. And he had to die for all the sins of every single believer because if he didn't die for all of them, then, then we would be disqualified for heaven. Right? If he died for 95% of our sins, or 99% of our sins, and left one or two undone, well, James 2.10 says, one sin condemns you for, for, to, for all eternity. It makes you guilty of the whole law. All right? So he had to die for all the sins, and he had to die for all the sins of anybody who's going to heaven is because, because he has died for all their sins. And that's the reason we can get there. We need him dying for all of our sins. That's part one. And we also need a perfect righteousness, which only he has, living a righteous life as a man, imputed or given to us. So we need, we need perfect forgiveness, perfect washing away of all of our sins, eradicating our debt, our sin debt, and at the same time giving us a perfect righteousness. And that, and that he takes all of our sins and pays them all. The penalty is done. And then he gives us his perfect righteousness, and now we're qualified for heaven. We have no sins on our record anymore, and we have a perfect righteousness. And that's the only way God accepts us, in him. All right, so it had to be all of them for every one of us. There's no believer who is in heaven now or will go to heaven that hasn't had every single sin that they would ever commit washed in the blood of Jesus. Okay. We have a verse in, uh, in John uh, 6, 65. He said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. Yeah. Yeah, so, and that, and that talks about election. So nobody can come to him unless it's been given by the Father, right? So, so, you know, no man wants to come to him until God changes the wanter, and the wanter is the heart, or given a new nature, right? So that's regeneration. So there needs to be regeneration before there could ever be saving faith. So we need to be brought to life first before we could ever believe and repent. And that's, that's, that's what Jesus is saying. All right, uh, and and so 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 simple biblical Christianity is that Christ actually achieved the salvation of all of God's elect. He actually achieved the salvation of all of God's elect. Uh, Arminianism, Arminianism holds to position number one that Christ died for all the sins of all men. That's the Arminian position, and that's about ninety-five percent of all churches out there, and probably where most of us have come from. At some time, at some time in our Christian lives, uh, and it teaches that he died for everybody. So therefore, everybody, everybody should, you know, everybody could and should be saved. Um, um, uh, but if this, if that position is true, then why are not all men freed from the punishment of all their sins? Now, what's the Arminian answer to that? So if you would ask somebody who's an Arminian, and you say, well, listen, you know, if, if if Christ died for all the sins of all men, then why is it that, that all men aren't freed from the punishment of their sins? Like, what, why, why, are they, why do they still go to hell? And what's the answer, do you think? You have to accept that he died for you. Okay. All right. Anyone else? That's, that's right. But there's another word I'm looking for. They chose not to believe. That's exactly right. Mm. All right. You're both right. So, so here's what they'll say. They'll, the answer will be because they refuse to believe in Jesus Christ, they're guilty of unbelief. All right, they say they refuse to believe, so they're guilty of unbelief. But here's the thing: this, this un, but if this unbelief uh, is it, is it, is it a sin or is it not a sin? Is this unbelief a sin or not a sin? Well, unbelief is a sin. How do we know that? Somebody read John six sixteen eight and nine. Unbelief is a sin. And when he has come, uh, the will. 
His will will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin uh, because they do not believe in me. Unbelief. All right? They don't believe. Well, well, if we say unbelief is not a sin, then why should anybody be punished for it? You, so if the Arminian says, well, you know what? You know, un unbelief is not a sin. Well, if that's the case, why should anybody be punished for it? So, so, so they'll use unbelief as, their, as the reason why people don't, don't go to heaven. But I would say the answer to that is because they're born in sin. So if they choose not to believe, you don't call it a sin, they have sin already, so right. they're damned. Right, but, but, but they're ra you're right. But their rationale is, the Arminian rationale is, the reason why anybody goes to hell is because they don't believe. They don't accept what God has given them for free. He, they don't accept the fact that Jesus died for their sins. So they say the reason that they don't accept is because of their unbelief. Uh, but, but if unbelief is a sin, and it is, then, then, then Christ was punished for it at his death as well. In other words, if unbelief is a sin, and it is a sin, then when he died for your sins, he died for that sin too. So when he died for the sins of the world, if we're going to, you know, and, and certainly when we didn't believe, right, when, 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 when you did not believe the gospel, when you did not believe in Jesus, when, he, when you be, did believe, right, that sin was covered as well. So why does the sin of unbelief cast you into hell, uh, and, you know, in, 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 in the Arminian position, but, but, but it doesn't, it, it, it's, not, it's, it's not, you know, covered by Jesus when he died for their sins. You know what I mean? Like, why are we separating this sin? It's a sin. So they will say, well, you know, the, 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 you know, the, 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 uh, the reason anybody goes to hell is because they don't believe. They don't accept what Jesus has given them. But that very same not acceptance is what Jesus died for. The sin of unbelief is what Jesus died for. Mm. So you see, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. If Christ paid for, for, for this sin uh, as well as others, then then why must this sin stop anyone from entering heaven? So if, if Jesus died for all your sins, so they will say, which is, would be true if you're a believer, then why do we separate unbelief as the one that sends you to hell? Why isn't that one covered as well? Of course it's covered, right? As we were not believers before we were saved, as we rejected the gospel before we were saved, that, those sins were covered at the cross. But the Arminian position is not. That's what takes, sends you to hell because you don't believe that's the sin that, that condemns you. Well, furthermore, uh, if Christ did not die for the sin of unbelief, then one cannot say that he died for all the sins of all men. He died for 99.9% .9 of the sins of all men. But he didn't die for all the sins, because if he died for all the sins, he'd have died for unbelief as well. So the many position is completely inconsistent, is what I'm saying. It's inconsistent in their rationale. Uh, so then, given the fact that the Bible explicitly teaches that many people will go to hell, uh, we basically are left with really two options as to why. One, the Calvinist position is that God never intended to save all men, uh, that he of his own good pleasure decided to save some men. And that's exactly what Romans 9 says. He made some for vessels of honor, and some he left for vessels of dishonor. He chose to, to, to save some and not others. And why? Ephesians 1 tells us for his own good pleasure. For his own good pleasure, that's it. Or, two, the Arminian position uh, is, it says that God really wants to save all men, but he does not have the power to do so, uh, so God is unable to save all men. Now, he wants to save all men, but all men don't want to be saved. That's the thing. He wants to save all men, but all men don't want to be saved because of their unbelief. But again, we go back to the fact that, that unbelief is a sin, and if Jesus died for your sins, he died for that one too. So then why, why are you condemned for unbelief? Does that make sense? That's the argument. Is this all like, all out, like out like in the zone here? <laughs> all right. Well, anyway, we'll pick it up next time. We'll look at what his death actually did accomplish. Then we'll look at some words that are used like world and all and whatnot. The point of all of this is, is really it's, it really is to glorify God in salvation. Uh, he saves... It's his work, you know, uh, you know, I, I didn't say this, but like, you know, like when we get to election and that's like, like today's topic is like the, the, the one that bothers most people the most. But, but unconditional election would be number two. But someone asked a question once and I want to, I want to share it again. They said, well, you know, like, like, how do I know if I'm the elect? Like, how do I know? You know how do I know if I'm the elect? And, and the answer is this, 
And this is what I've said to people. Because they get worried. Well, how do, I don't know the, the eternal decrees of God. I can't see behind the curtain, so to speak, you know. And, and the answer is, you know, you know, do you believe in him? Do you believe that, that you're a sinner and that he has saved you? Yes, I do. I said, well, you're the elect. There you go. You're the elect. Do you believe you're the elect? It doesn't make a difference who you are. You believe in Christ as your Lord and Savior and you're following you're the elect. You know, it's not, not complicated. You know? No one even understands this until afterwards anyway. But, but if you believe, you're it. So from, from our standpoint, we can't see God's eternal decrees and who he's saving. And we have no clue. We just know he is. Uh, but when someone does believe, then we know they're the elect. Even though they don't know it. All right, any questions? Your comments? All right, let's pray. Father, we just praise you and thank you for your marvelous, wonderful works uh, in creation and then in recreation, saving sinners, Lord. Thank you uh, for your wonderful gift of salvation through Christ, empowered by your spirit. Uh, Lord, help us to, to exalt you all the more uh, Lord, knowing that, Lord, we had absolutely no part of our salvation in you, uh, Lord, you rescued us. Lord, you took us from the dead and brought us to life, and uh, Lord, you put your spirit in us, uh, and Lord, you, you applied Jesus' work to us. He literally died for us, literally came to save us. Lord, love kept him hanging on a cross for us, uh, and Lord, you were satisfied in his atonement for us. And so, Father, we pray that we would exalt you for it, Help us praise you more and glorify you more uh, as we understand, Lord, just how amazing it is that we're in your kingdom. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.